Demet okay. Hocam. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you, Sinem Hocam. Good evening. Uh, welcome to do our first uh, Arca Design Timber Talks for uh, fall semester. Uh, this evening we have a valuable guest, uh, engineer Mr. Errol Karaja Bey from Vancouver, Canada. Uh, thank you, Mr. Errol Bey, uh, Errol Bey, to being with us. It's our pleasure to host you this evening. Uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the meeting, I would like to introduce uh, him. Uh, then I will leave the screen to him. Uh, uh, Errol Karaja Bey, uh, after graduating from Istanbul Technical University as a civil engineer, he received two master's degree from Yildiz Technical University and the University of British Columbia, Canada. With more than five uh, to 35 years of research and development experience in wood structures, uh, he has served in earthquake commissions of both Canada and the United States, served as chairman of the Timber Structures Technical Committee of the International Standard Organization for 10 years, and served as adjunct, uh, adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia. He has more than uh, 200 publications on timber engineering and many awards given to him in the United States and Canada. The Wood Building System Group of First Product Innovations Research Center, of which Carol Jabeli was the director till uh, 2015, has published numerous multidisciplinary handbooks and on wood structures. Uh, and Karaja Bailey, who has close relationship uh, relation with wood world in many countries, has twice served as the president of the Turkish Canadian so Society in Vancouver and Canada. Uh, and uh, during the presentation, uh, the students and the, the listeners can uh, please note your uh, questions. And uh, we have a at the end of the presentation, uh, you can ask your questions directly and also you can write your questions to uh, chat box and we can uh, read it. The, the, the desk is yours, Mr. Karaja well, Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Surucu. Uh, maybe I should just simply start. My outline today, I'm going to start with a bit of history in Turkey regarding uh, uh, wood structures. Then I will move into some countries that kept their wood building culture. Then I will move on to wood based building systems, light wood frame, mass timber, hybrid applications touching up a little bit on prefabrication because that's extremely important for wood structures. And uh, also I will touch on regulatory acceptance in Turkey. I will move on to performance attributes uh, and I will focus on mostly on earthquake performance. And I will share with you some guides and handbooks which uh, I was involved in the past 10, 20 years, and they are free to download, and uh, and they are multidisciplinary guides. It's kind of an interesting, unique concept, and I will uh, finish my presentation. What was a dominant building material in Istanbul and Anatolia in the 19th century and earlier? From my perspective, the main reason was the better earthquake performance. And I will come to that. Throughout 20th century, concrete buildings took over and the main reason was the fire performance. Now, I was just looking at some of the uh, past events. In 1509, there was an earthquake in Istanbul it's called Kiameti Sura or Little Apocalypse. And uh, then 1766, Istanbul had another big one. Then 1894, Istanbul had another big one. And in the 1999, the earthquake in Kocaeli or Gölcük 
also had big effects in Istanbul. While these earthquakes are happening, of course, there were many, many other earthquakes, but these are the big ones that I was able to spot. But in the meanwhile, in 1515, 1569, 1633, 1645, and so on, Istanbul had huge fires. Entire vicinities got lost and many, many wood buildings burned. So Istanbul wobbled between earthquakes and fires, all the history. Now, uh, this is, a, I found a paper by Dr. Hamid Cezer and about a study related to a report on 1894 Istanbul earthquake that I just mentioned. Apparently, Sultan Abdelhamid II second, commissioned Dimitrius Egenitis, the director of the Greek National Observatory, to come to Istanbul and produce a report. The report, and by the way, I translated it. It's very interesting, uh, of course, uh, very Ottoman in Turkish there. The fact that most households are made of wood has led to minimal casualties and damage. The wooden houses have endured the earthquake to an outstanding degree. Even the poorly built old wooden houses remain intact while the well-built new masonry houses, even connected with iron bars, did not survive. This is from the report. And, uh, and this actually, I will later on, I will uh, mention about the wood frame buildings, the Western style, how did they do in earthquakes? But this is an interesting thing. So if you can address the fire issue, this uh, clearly tells that uh, the wood buildings behaved very well in at least in that particular earthquake. So I have some examples. Still, this uh, there are some towns, and I am so grateful to these uh, people that they are keeping their wood buildings. And uh, this is Bay Pazare. I think I took that, that photo. Trabzon, Shirince. And also, since uh, there is lots of architectural uh, stuff here and uh, members, uh, always I admire the way the buildings are respecting each other in terms of view. And uh, Now, this slide is from Professor Zeynep Ahonmay, uh, one of the people that I was privileged to meet, and uh, I respect her a lot. And this is her slide, actually. I translated it, and, uh, and she mentions that why the traditional Turkish houses are important, the, because of the cultural values they possess and uh, usage related values everything has a purpose for instance uh, many cases uh, they are using uh, can you see my cursor uh, Demet Hanım? yes yes okay, we can see great. for example this masonry in the first story th th there are reasons behind it like durability reasons and other reasons and uh, every piece of wood or every piece of masonry here has a purpose. And the abstract values, memories, traditions, and identity. It, I, I cannot overemphasize this because uh, I was visiting China uh, with my colleagues, and they were originally from China. and. Uh, we were, I think, in Shanghai, and uh, one of them asked me, hey, Errol, how do you find Shanghai? Well, I said, 
it's beautiful. You have very nice skyscrapers and uh, TV towers and lights and everything else. And I said, but where is your culture? In Beijing was different. Beijing kept its culture a bit more. Same question for all the cities. And I'm grateful that some of, some of the buildings are being kept in, 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 in Turkey. This book uh, by Professor Doan Kuban, unfortunately, I didn't have the privilege to meet with him. And uh, Dr. Hilmi Lush from Boazici University gave me this book as a gift. And I, I am so grateful to him too. And uh, great book. I highly recommend it. Professor Kuban tells what is Hayatlı Ev, Hayat is the lively space that rooms open to and, uh, and invites people towards home. On the back of his book, though, he says, newly developed architecture has destroyed centuries of architectural and aesthetic tradition and the stylistic and special sensibility associated with them. In the spring of 2017, when these lines were written, Turkey has not yet been able to create a unique architectural style. I know some of the audience here today are architects. And uh, when I told one Turkish architect, Aytaç Mancho one day, why the buildings are so ugly here? And then he said, Errol, please criticize me with my own work. And I respect that. And, um, but the thing is, Turkey, Turkey had an architectural style one time, and uh, we lost it at this point, and I hope we will gain that back. Another professor, Reha Günay, again, I didn't have a chance to meet with him, and this, he wrote a book about Safranbolu houses. And uh, beautiful book, talks about similar things that Professor Kuban and Professor Ahumbay mentioned. And he says, the few houses that remain in a deteriorating environment or rather in an apartment environment, gives us information about the old texture of that neighborhood as well as show us the change of time where society, economy, technology, and urbanization are going. And he says, you can either take a lesson or say change is essential, it couldn't be otherwise and forget about it. I hope we will not forget about it because if we do, we are ending up on the photo on the right hand side. It is becoming a concrete jungle and that way we are not able to develop an architectural style. On 17th of August 1999, uh, I, myself, my wife and two kids, we were traveling from Bodrum to, to Istanbul. And three hours after the earthquake, we got, we entered into the zone, earthquake zone. And actually, this is what we saw. Some buildings turn into a rubble. Over 17,000 casualties. And from my perspective, the life safety objective maintained in most earthquake codes has not been met in that earthquake. Quite a few buildings, they basically collapsed. They were supposed to stay intact. They could have damage, but they shouldn't collapse. And 24 years later, this year, in uh, Kahramanmaraş, Hatay, and, and also in Syria and some other 
our cities and other a number of earthquakes hit and again many buildings many buildings while they are staying intact or they are staying you know with some damage which is expected but many buildings completely collapsed and over 55,000 casualties again from my perspective life safety objective has not been met again now the result is the considerable number of reinforced concrete buildings in Turkey may not have the sufficient resistance to withstand large earthquakes. That's my conclusion. And that's a ticking time bomb problem. We don't know when the next one is going to hit. And uh, I understand today there was uh, an earthquake uh, uh, a smaller one uh, from a distance to Istanbul. I don't know if it was felt, but earthquakes always happen. And but the large ones will eventually, may eventually hit. It can happen tomorrow. It can happen in two hundred years. But the thing is, uh, uh, those seventy-two thousand people in those two earthquakes, they lost their lives. That's the fact. Now, enough for bad news. <laughs> I'm going to go to <laughs> good stuff as well in my presentation. And uh, Mr. Demet Suju shared this slide with me <laughs> many years ago. And uh, this building on the left-hand side, which needed a lot of attention, and they, they, it was given the attention and it was uh, completely maintained and repaired. And uh, it looks much better. And this, this slide always has given me hope because there are, this is not the only project in Istanbul and in, 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 in Anatolia I have seen. After the, I think, 1999 earthquake, uh, these wood, wood buildings were built by Kantashe Inshat and uh, Miss uh, Ebru Kantashe Mert, who is an architect, shared with me this, this photo. Actually, I visited those buildings. This is more recent, a lot more recent, and uh, two challenging projects. One by uh, I was uh, this was uh, shared with me by Mr. Ahmed Topash, Vehime Sultan Yalısı, a difficult, challenging project actually, and the other one is uh, uh, Mr. Mehmet Akif Asmas, two esteemed engineers, Portakal Hafızkola, another challenging project, and these projects have been completed, and. Uh, this is also good because uh, these are all saying that, and by the way, these are not the only projects uh, are in, in Turkey. I am just sharing with you what uh, was shared with me. And um, I'm sure there are other projects. Even more uh, recently, uh, Mr. Jalalettin Akça, who is the president of the Turkish Timber Association shared with me these photos. This is from uh, uh, Forestry General Directorate, Hatay Hassa project. They are using light frame. Uh, and this is uh, very encouraging that uh, the Forestry Ministry is uh, seriously uh, looking at uh, using uh, wood in their projects. I'm very grateful for that. I just wanted to share with you these two uh, two structures. They are over century centuries old. The one on the left hand side, in uh, built in 1905 in Vancouver, Canada, it's a nine story building. Inside is all heavy timber, heavy timber columns, heavy timber beams, and uh, floors. And I think originally it was more of a depot type uh, thing and building and outside on the perimeter 
it's using masonry walls and unreinforced masonry is uh, does not do well in earthquakes so this building got lucky in 1980s and it got seismically upgraded also uh, architecturally uh, renovated now it's housing some high-tech software companies it's also lucky that it was in a very uh, good location in the city on the right hand side the building six-story wood building built believe it or not in istanbul at the end of 19th century and it was originally a casino and hotel never used for that purpose and then it served as a greek orphanage and uh, but it's pretty well left to die i am hoping that actually this building can be maybe replaced probably it may have to be demolished because it's probably in very sad shape right now but maybe it can be replaced with a wood building one day the important part the the fact of the matter is a six-story wood building was built at the end of 19th century in Istanbul. In British Columbia, Canada, we tried to get the light frame buildings from four story, the limit in the code, to six story. That was a very long battle. It is now accepted in British Columbia. I will show you a few photographs. Now, many of you can say, hey, our wood buildings uh, can last. Well, this is a chef of the mosque. It's over 700 years old and still there. And there are more examples in Turkey like this. So if the, if the building is designed well, right species, right uh, design is done, the wood building can last centuries. It's a good example of that. Now I'm going to move on to countries that kept their wood building culture. Canada, USA, Europe, particularly Scandinavian countries, Austria, France, Germany, and Japan. I particularly take attention on Japan because that's a country its uh, its area is about one half of Turkey. Its population is 50% higher than Turkey. And they are still living in wood houses. Australia, of course, has a lot of land and uh, they are uh, building with wood. New Zealand is another country that is it's a good idea to take a look about their plantation forests. They have lots. When you are flying over New Zealand, you can see them. And uh, now the question is, why economically richer countries are still building with wood? Some of you may think, hey, they are rich, so they can afford it. Wood is expensive. Well. I have to tell you that that is not the correct answer because, for example, in Canada, every time I talk to contractors, it's all money. If wood costs a lot more than reinforced concrete, they will always use reinforced concrete. But the thing is, it's a matter of infrastructure, availability, designers, and what have you. That makes the difference. So what are the drivers for wood construction? One of them is the housing needs due to population growth. The world is now 8.1 billion people, and they are predicting that it will go to 10 billion probably in the, after 2050s. And at some point it's gonna start stabilizing, but that's not in the next one or two decades. The other one is urbanization. 
people are moving from uh, urban areas to cities. Climate change is huge and those countries um, are using wood as to combat with climate change is one of the items, of course. And, uh, and sustainable, because of that, uh, many cities are, they are setting goals for sustainability. Now the climate change for a long time, you know, the scientists were saying, and then now it's getting more and more serious. And uh, every country, especially the developed countries, they are taking uh, big steps towards it. And this is going to hit uh, all the countries. And uh, so wood is one of the answers. And these countries, uh, because of that, the, there are programs in uh, many countries that I mentioned that, is, that are supporting the extensive use of wood. As an example, for instance, British Columbia has, a, in Canada, has a Wood First Act. The government says in government buildings, you have to consider wood. And because of that, many buildings are using wood. So this is important for the policymakers, the government people, they really have to look at this and see what they can do. And I'm very happy that Ministry of Forestry in Turkey is already taking steps towards that. And what are the attributes of wood construction? Well, first of all, it's, it's a faster, cleaner, and quieter project delivery. Because you don't have to have a form. And uh, most of the stuff is coming from, uh, coming in a prefabricated way, especially in uh, Europe. And wood is a renewable, of course, if it is coming from sustainable forestry, and it's a carbon sink. Again, it's it's a, 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 a as as long as the building uh, is is intact. Of course, when the building is 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 finishing its lifetime, uh, it can the wood products can be reused, recycled, repurposed. All those things are available. And uh, one. Uh, important attribute is uh, it's naturally resistant against earthquakes but uh, i would like this not to be taken uh, for granted it has to be designed properly it has to be built properly of course it doesn't mean that you can build with wood and don't worry about it no it has to be done right in like like other materials by natural resistance, because of it's so lightweight, it's not attracting big forces. And because it's very flexible, it's energy dissipative. So when you put those two things together, that's the naturally world is coming there. The aesthetics and health benefits, one of my colleagues did his PhD on health benefits. And uh, now there are more studies on that, showing that people are happier, healthier in wood buildings. And versatile to repurpose, because every building has a lifetime, and then uh, the building has to be sometimes repurposed. And wood buildings lend themselves easier for that. Now, what are the must-haves for sustainable wood construction? The first one is sustainable forestry. I was uh, looking at some countries, for instance, Finland, their area, more than 75% is forest land. So Finland is able to sustainably harvest their forest and they use wood everywhere and they sell wood abroad 
But if sustainable forestry is not there, then I don't think, uh, you know, the one should get into wood buildings. That's that that essential, extremely important. That's the reason my title was grow more trees, then build more with wood. Now, wood building culture, of course, uh, for example, in Canada, uh, you have the whole thing. You have the materials, you have the designers familiar with wood. You have the whole infrastructure ready to go. And the contractors are familiar with it. Insurance industry familiar with it. And uh, you have fire consultants, you have acoustic consultants, and it comes with the whole thing. The thing is, all these, these uh, disciplines are available for, I'm sure, for, for example, reinforced concrete buildings in Turkey. So those consultants, the continuing education and universities, this is where they come in in there. And so important to basically educate those disciplines because people are there. All they have to do is they have to learn the wood buildings. Once those two things are there, then you can talk about the uh, the light light wood buildings and also maybe heavy timber or mass timber or and uh, and uh, hybrid buildings. Little bit on engineered wood products. Lumber, visually or machine graded lumber, is an engineered wood product. I am very uh, happy to report that uh, the Turkish species have been tested, design values have been uh, developed in Turkey. That's in the last decade or so. This is very good uh, progress. Panels, wood eye joists, wood trusses, especially metal wood trusses. Uh, for example, 90% of uh, uh, housing in North America are using metal plated wood trusses, all prefabricated, coming to the job site. Glued laminated timber, an older product. Structural composite lumber, you may hear them as LVL, PSL, NSL. And then cross laminated timber, this CLT, is a relatively newer product, a few decades old. And uh, it's basically just simply laminating, uh, laminating lumber members crosswise like this. And it's used for walls and floors a lot. Similarly, double laminated timber, NLT, and nail laminated timber. You will hear them. Uh, and then all these products actually is helping uh, wood, pro wood projects uh, to be, uh, they all have their own niche applications. So in those countries that are economically richer at this point of history, because history shows that sometimes you may be rich this millennium, but you may not be rich in the next one. With the advent of engineered wood products and systems push and push for sustainable construction solutions, particularly to tackle climate change, Building with wood is becoming more prominent in the 21st century. You will hear more and more about those countries. They are using wood in even different applications, like tall buildings. A little bit on wood-based building systems, because this is quite important to know. Now, light wood frame, First of all, I should just move into light wood frame. 
Now, this is kind of the bread and butter system in North America for wood. You, you hear from me and from others, mass timber, hybrid, those are very nice and very, from a research perspective, very interesting. But the majority of the buildings, housing particularly, is done with light wood. So this has to be known. It's the system that is most optimized, if you will, in terms of the materials. And why it is light wood? Well, basically, it's, uh, it's so light that uh, two strong workers, as you can see, can uh, lift a wall. I don't think you can lift a CLT wall like that. And uh, so the infrastructure is there for it, and it is still the dominant system. For example, most single family houses in Canada and USA are light wood frame. And uh, when I say most, it's probably more than 90%. The interesting part is light wood frame from probably earlier, earlier, earlier 1800s, one story to two story. It went to apartment buildings, three story and four story. And recently it went into like in Canada, five and six and in the US even went more than that. And the majority of five and six story apartment buildings in Canada are built with light wood frame construction. That's quite important. This is what I was talking about earlier from the cost perspective. If they are not cost competitive, the, the, the contractors would use whatever the cost competitive solution is. Now, lots of, I'm gonna show you lots of hybrid applications and uh, because, uh, for example, one of them is light wood frame buildings on reinforced concrete podium. And uh, you can see here in this building, uh, it's using five story wood on three story concrete po podium. It's actually, it's an eight story building here. It's from US. And again, you can see here uh, concrete first story in this building and wood on top. Now, when you look at this from an uh, earthquake engineering perspective, you can see that the building is a lot lighter than an eight story reinforced concrete building or masonry, reinforced masonry building. So it has some advantages and also it's cost effective. That's one of the reasons that's being used. A little bit on examples of mass timber buildings. Here you have the Wood Innovation and Design Center designed by Michael Green, uh, one of our uh, prominent architects. It's an old, old wood mass timber building. It's not using a, a different material here. This one is an eight story office high rise in Austria. It's the Cree system. This one is highly prefabricated system and so much that they were able to do one story per day. Eight story building in eight days. Interesting, isn't it? This one is from a 14 story wood building from Norway and it's using mass timber truss system on the perimeter and inside it's using light frame modules for the apartments. Uh, Norway is uh, well known with their bridge engineers and uh, I believe that's not a very high seismic zone for probably the lateral design is governed by the wind loads. So they, they had this truss design in uh, two buildings, which I will show you later on. More examples. This one is Arbora complex in Montreal. Eight-story multi-family residential building 
This one is also all wood. This one is origin in Quebec City, 13 story multi story, multi family residential building. And this is using a CLT core, it's a wood core. On the other hand, this building, Brock Commons in Vancouver, it's an 18 story building. The first story is concrete, and 17 stories are wood. And this building has two. Um, two uh, reinforced concrete cores as the lateral system. And at the top, it has a steel roof. And the, and the, the skin of the building is not combustible. It's a steel-based uh, building envelope. So it's a true hybrid building. It's a student resident, residence. And... Uh, that is the highest wood building in, uh, in Vancouver. This building is from Vancouver Island and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's in the, it, the interesting part about this building is it's using steel eccentrically braced frames as the lateral system. And I think this will allow this building when it, it comes to its uh, finishing its lifetime, probably this building can be dismantled quite easily because the steel members can be just taken away and, uh, and the wood members can be recycled. So it's a uh, it's in the Vancouver Island. It's using uh, CLT as well as glulam columns, but the, if you can, if you can see, there are no beams because they were able to use the beams, as the the, the the plate in the two A action, and the spans were not very big, so they were able to do almost like a flat slab. Uh, application here. These are some of the buildings in the last couple of decades have been uh, built. The first one here is Murray Grow. It is uh, in London and uh, England. And it's all CLT building, nine story high and uh, one of the older applications. This building is in Australia, Melbourne, and uh, this is a 10-story building, very similar applications between these two. And I already mentioned about this street building previously, 14-story in, in Norway. This is the one that they used light frame uh, modules prefabricated. This is the brick building that I just showed you in Vancouver, Brock Commons building, 18 story until uh, this is after its completion. This is another building, 18 story in Norway. And this building is also using a perimeter, perimeter, uh, heavy braced um, uh, trusses. This building is the Ho-Ho building in Austria. It's using uh, reinforced concrete uh, core and uh, it is 24 story and it is using uh, uh, concrete wood composite members. So the, most of these buildings, as you can see, they are hybrid buildings. And this is the uh, building that is considered as the highest building, wood building, 25 stories in uh, Milwaukee in USA. And uh, this building is also using a, a, a concrete core and also concrete podium, six-story concrete podium here. 
And uh, this building is also using uh, a non-combustible envelope. I mentioned about the prefabricated systems, and uh, it, it can be happening in components level, like one dimensional, or panelized systems, two dimensional, or modular, three dimensional. So it can happen uh, in, 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 in all these uh, forms. And prefabrication. Uh, wood products are lending themselves so well to it. And that is one of the biggest advantages uh, of, uh, and it is, uh, it is actually a lot more prominent in European uh, countries. And prefabrication is coupled with uh, three-dimensional computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing, building informa information modeling softwares, and structural analysis softwares. So basically, virtually, you are building the building in your uh, computer, and then in the automated manufacturing environment, the, uh, the, the two-dimensional, for instance, pieces here, in this case, panels are being prepared, and some actually two-dimensional and three-dimensional members are coming to the site with even uh, windows and everything else. So uh, this one uh, cannot be uh, overemphasized. It's an example of light wood frame building with prefabricated panels. The panels come to the site, and then uh, basically the crane just simply puts them like Legos on top. At the end, although this building probably using kind of a vine uh, brick veneer outside, and uh, but it is uh, a light wood frame building. It's probably using a uh, first story concrete again, sometimes shops. With mass timber, same thing. Members, uh, this is the Brock Commons building, and uh, uh, a CLT panel. As you can see, many uh, many pieces. The pieces are already uh, carved in the factory, ready to go to receive the connectors. Everything else. Same building. For instance, this is the CLT slab. This building is also using no beams. It's a kind of a flat slab. And uh, this connection is very important here because if you have this column and the column on top, squeeze the CLT piece and, uh, and the 17 story high building, then this CLT will, have, will deform with time. And then that will create all kinds of issues. On the other hand, the designers came up with a, a innovative solution here and using this details so that the column from the top is giving the vertical loads, the column on the bottom with, with, this, uh, with this detail. Again, this one is a different project. All these wall panels, CLT wall panels, came from the factory with holes and everything else already ready to go. A little bit on the regulatory acceptance. Now, Turkey accepted Eurocode 5 which is design of timber structures. Europeans spent a lot of resources. And then what they did at the end is they developed their European codes and everybody is uh, now developing, uh, using them. And uh, many countries are issuing an annex 
kind of to add some of the stuff that they they from their own countries. And uh, so Europe Euro Code 5 is there. And there is a draft regulation and uh, under the leadership of Professor Ahmed Tular from Middle Eastern Technical University, uh, design, calculation, and construction principles of wooden buildings, a draft regulation. It has been drafted and under review. This is a, this is a very good uh, uh, development. And there is an old, uh, older standard, building code for timber structures. In the, in the codes and standards world, these things converge with time. And uh, at the end, uh, sometimes one of them uh, is used or sometimes all of them stay, uh, stay there and then uh, they are used for different purposes. The important, one important item here, as I mentioned a bit earlier, is the design values of lumber with Turkish species. Testing is completed and uh, strength classes have been, have been uh, developed. That's very important. I'm going to go to now to the performance attributes. Well, I'm a, I, I worked as a structural engineer most of my time. So I didn't pay attention to the other ones for a while until I found out that the acoustic consultant was trying to decouple everything we were doing actually. So some attributes, performance attributes like noise control and structural, they actually fight against each other because uh, if the if the if you loosen the building for example less stiff and everything else and then it may actually do well in in in, in noise control that's what i am understanding from them so it's a balance and uh, so because of that we have to understand that and at the end of the day i, I think I the uh, biggest uh, task is how do you balance these things and uh, balancing these performance attributes. From my perspective, it is an art and a science. For example, fire performance. Uh, this is a very important topic and I suggested to Ms. Demet Surji that maybe she can invite a fire expert to talk about this in length, but uh, uh, I found this uh, slide and, uh, and I found it very useful. How do you get the fire performance? Because earlier uh, I mentioned that, you know, one of the uh, things that wood is a combustible material. How do you design safely, as safe as other materials? And that is what we are having right now in, in many countries. Otherwise, insurance people wouldn't insure those buildings. Now, the first one is the prevention. For example, encapsulation. Many buildings are being encapsulated. What I, what I mean by encapsulating is the wood members are hidden behind, for example, gypsum moldboard. And many layers of them, depending on the building, depending on the fire designer. Brock Commons building at, at, in certain places had four layers of gypsum moldboard. So the fire cannot penetrate to wood. Fire detection is a very important one, such as smoke detectors. They tell the users that there is something here. And in my lifetime, in wood buildings, I had two uh, kitchen fires. In both of them, I was able to put it off with a fire extinguisher. We didn't have to even call the fire brigade. So that was the user fire fighting. Well, if that doesn't work, then the springer, the fire springer comes into the picture. 
whichever room it is, it extinguishes the the fire. And uh, in Europe, uh, there are some steam applications as well. And uh, they are claiming that that's very successful as well. But the ones that we have mostly are uh, wood based, water based, and uh, uh, Springer basically gets uh, activated by the heat and extinguishes the fire. Of course, the fire brigade is another level, and uh, they come in. And uh, one of the one of the uh, remedies that they use is uh, compartmentation, uh, compartmentation, and basically putting the building. Uh, for instance, uh, sometimes when you have adjacent buildings, you have uh, non-combustible uh, reinforced masonry firewalls between buildings, so that if what building burns, it doesn't go to the next one. I'm sorry. So this is a this is a Swiss cheese approach, but it's a very very important topic, and uh, you know in in North America, fire consultants basically just like structural consultants they they design the wood building. Another one is very important, noise control. You can have impact noise from the footsteps. It can travel, boom, 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 come to your, your thing. Or airborne noise, your, your neighbor may have a very loud music. And the airborne sound can go transmission through the wall. Or we call it clanking noise. It can go through the floors or ceilings like this. And uh, this is a very important area. Again, acoustical consultants. Uh, they 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 work on these areas and uh, for example in apartment buildings they suggest uh, concrete topping on the floors and uh, sometimes double walls between uh, between the units and uh, etc. Another important very important uh, one is durability. Although I showed you a, a, a mosque which is 700 more than 700 years old, but uh, we also had uh, lots of problems in walls in Vancouver at one time, because uh, because of the energy efficiency, uh, the, the the insulation was put into the into the cavity and the water get into the cavity. Well, that's then then that caused uh, rotting in the wood, and. Now to, to uh, combat with that problem, uh, there is this 4D approach. First, deflection by eaves and cladding. You can see that this is one. The two is drainage of water behind cladding. I will show you a slide right after this one for that. And then drying by diffusion and uh, ventilation. And finally, if you suspect that water will be there, then you use durable materials like pressure treated wood in certain applications. Here is the rain screen system that does that in a very nutshell. These are some strips and uh, I think they are pressure treated uh, strips. This is building paper. Behind that, probably there is either a rigid insulation or panel. And there is a here. There is an air. Uh, there is an emptiness here between. And the, if the water for some reason gets in there, it kind of goes down and escapes from here. So right now, for instance, in Vancouver, most buildings are built similarly to that, so that we don't have any problem within the walled cavity. Now, performance in earthquakes. My colleague Hans Reiner and I, we reduced quite a few reports. They were on my desk and uh, 
quite a few reports to 28 page document report. This is a summary report. And uh, how did wood frame, light wood frame construction did in earthquakes? And it's a publication available free of charge from FP Innovation site. It's also available in five languages. And uh, what we did there is we looked at life losses in seven earthquakes. Earlier, I talked about the life safety objective, and this is what we were looking at here. The seven earthquakes where uh, there were quite a few uh, wooden building houses shaken in the order of about uh, close to 400,000. This gives the magnitude of the earthquakes. This gives number of people lost their lives. And this, this gives number of people lost their lives in light wood frame houses. The 16 plus four, we put it this way because in this Northridge earthquake, there were 20 casualties, but 16 of them was in one building, one apartment building. So the total casualties in seven earthquakes are less than 34. Of course, zero would have been much preferable, but with respect to other earthquakes, like the ones that I mentioned in Turkey, this number, we say the life safety objective has been achieved. I must add, actually, this is a good thing. Out of the 6,300 casualties, there were zero casualties in 8,000 light frame houses in Kobe. They were uh, uh, Japanese people, they call them two by four construction. But about 4,000 of them were in Japanese style, old post and beam buildings with very heavy roofs. So when I said naturally good, it doesn't mean that every building will survive, every wood building will survive an earthquake. So that lightness is, is quite important in that sense. So this, uh, this is basically all we are, I am presenting you here is what we, gathered from the reconnaissance studies on these seven earthquakes. I'm going to show you, uh, this is a seven story building and uh, the first story is steel platform. And then you have six story uh, wood frame, light wood frame building, hopefully the, uh, and then uh, this is a shake table test in a very big shake table in, in Japan. I think the rest is self-explanatory in the video.
this is the top story giving you a good indication that you should really tie your bookshelves to the walls in buildings. Building is doing well, but on the other hand, bookshelves will not do well if they are not tied to the, to the walls. And this one is a different uh, test. The other one was a light wood frame building. And uh, this one is a, a CLT building. In October 2007, a 24-meter high, seven-story Sophie building made entirely of wood, more than 250 cubic meters, coming from the certified forests of the Fiemme Valley, was constructed on the monster table in Niki in order to be subjected to the earthquake that 12 years ago hit the Hyogo prefecture. The event was followed by researchers, professionals, executives and contractors from all over the world. Delegations from Canada, the United States, Colombia, Vietnam, India, New Zealand, Germany, Korea and Slovenia attended the press conference, while many ordinary people who had experienced the tragedy of 1995 watched the seismic test attentively. Hundreds of people with different motivations, but united by the same incredulous curiosity to see an experiment that had never been ventured before. The testing program scheduled the successive execution of two seismic accelerograms. The recent Niigata Chetsu Oki earthquake in July Hanshin Awaji earthquake in 1995, known as the Kobe earthquake. After more than 10 consecutive tests, 
no residual displacement was observed. In other words, the building always returned to its position without altering the structure. Never before had a wooden building of such dimensions resisted a similar impact. The building oscillated for a couple of seconds, uplifted slightly, and returned to its initial position, causing only minor damage, which is easily repairable. An unprecedented experiment which will change the way of building houses all over the world. By the way, that was uh, Professor Ario Cecotti. Uh, Professor Cecotti came to Canada, worked with me for about two years or three, I think. And then later on, he became a visiting professor at Boazic University for two years. He taught uh, timber engineering. He's a very good friend of mine. So all that kind of information in the last couple of decades, I would say. Uh, and then we, we summarized it in handbooks and, uh, and uh, guides. One of them is the CLT handbook. And this one includes a design example of an eight-story mass timber building. I understand uh, many students of the Vetadub already downloaded them, but I put them here again because they are free PDF downloadable. And uh, thanks to FP Innovations, they, uh, they basically made it free. And for hard copies can be ordered from Amazon. This one is the CLT handbook. The other one is the technical guide for the design and construction of tall wood buildings. Many of these latest projects that I mentioned are there. And one important topic is the alternative solutions. Every code has a, a, a clause saying, well, if you bring something very different, as long as you, you satisfy the objectives in the code, you can develop an alternate solution. The thing is, to develop an alternate solution, you need knowledge. And this is where you can find a lot of knowledge. And these handbooks and guides, uh, this is a very unique concept because they are written by researchers and practitioners. So that's a very interesting, and then they are all peer reviewed. So when you are looking at, for instance, a fire chapter here, that you are gonna see how do you develop the fire design here for a tall wood building. It gives you step by step. And uh, so I highly recommend these books uh, uh, in that sense. This is for the light wood frame buildings, mid-rise, we call it five to six story buildings, handbook. And uh, again, this includes lots of good details. This is a very new one last year we, uh, that was released. This is a modeling guide for timber structures and particularly from a structural perspective. And uh, it gives, uh, it includes actually hybrid structures as well. It's a unique, uh, unique uh, uh, publication. And finally, uh, there is a design guide for timber concrete composite floors. You can see that here, I didn't get into detail on this particular application, but these are connectors. And then uh, this is timber, and then you pour concrete on top, and then it becomes timber concrete composite. And uh, uh, this one, uh, you are able to pass bigger spans, basically. All that knowledge is available. Uh, and then the, the shake table tests were a good testament of what can be done with wood systems.
Well, I try to make a case for you today that wood co construction is a suitable choice for earthquake prone areas. Considerable number of reinforced concrete buildings in Turkey need to be rebuilt as they may not have the sufficient resistance to withstand large earthquakes. I call that a ticking time bomb problem, particularly big for big cities like Istanbul, because if Istanbul faces such a big earthquake, like the one that happened in Karaman Maraş, the, the result would be a lot more catastrophic from my perspective. The richer countries are increasing their forests and constructing more wood hybrid buildings with concrete and steel and masonry. And it is time to have a wood construction strategy for Turkey, but it should include all the parties and uh, particularly policymakers, if they also participate or lead this, this kind of strategy, uh, that would help a lot. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you, uh, Erol Bey, for your uh, very clear, very informative presentation. It's like a lecture uh, because we start for, with uh, historical buildings, then we step by step, we uh, up to the tall buildings. Uh, and for our citizens and uh, audience, I think it's like a um, full lecture uh, and full with all uh, keywords like noise control, fire protection, and uh, especially earthquake resistance uh, and uh, earthquake performance of timber. So I am very happy to uh, sharing the time with you here. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Uh, maybe our uh, friends and uh, our professors have some questions for you. Um, I'm looking for questions. Is there any question for Mr. Errol Karajavedi? No, no question. Everything is very clear. <laughs> okay, yes. Eddie for job. I was waiting for the uh, for the question coming from the students, so I waited. But I can I don't know is it a question or is it just uh, a point of discussion? Uh, because uh, 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 Mr. Karajabeyli talked also about knowledge. So in Turkey, the situation um, at the, uh, recently is like that. There is an interest for timber buildings, and we are also observing a lot of interest uh, from the engineering side and also from architect side and so on. But knowledge is also needed for the labor, uh, especially mm -hmm. for timber constructions. Mm -hmm. And if you mention that Turkey had already also with concrete buildings or reinforced concrete buildings so problems uh, that means uh, we are um, somehow uh, expecting uh, a uncertain future for the next five years maybe because we have to educate also our labor i think what do you think about this topic well that's uh, that's such an important one and uh, now certain uh, for instance, in Canada, we have some uh, schools. They are very good in teaching how to build with wood. And I know, like, I think it was in Rosenheim Institute in, I think, in Germany. Mm -hmm. They do the same thing. And as far as I know, uh, like Yildiz University one time was like that maybe uh, modeled like that. So, uh, of course, I don't know where Turkey schools are in this, but this is a very, very important topic 
and uh, uh, Demetano, maybe you can comment on this one too because you have some uh, <laughs> experience in this one. <laughs> okay, uh, Ilfo Jam, uh, also a lecturer of the contemporary timber structures, uh, contemporary timber buildings and structural si systems, uh, lecture in Bahçeşehir University, uh, Erol Jam. Yes, we are trying to explain how to build uh, with wood. Uh, we are trying to explain the students uh, in our faculty. But this is the first step, uh, it's a small step for us. I guess we need time for this, not only mm -hmm. at our university also, but other universities are, are start to do something. Uh, but uh, we have a few lines. First, we have to understand the materials and we have to understand how we build with timber. So the sector, Turkish uh, uh, timber industry, must uh, promote building with timber, and then then uh, new designers can start or think with timber, think about timber. Start because we are trying to do this for. I am trying to do this for last fifteen years or twenty years, maybe, but fifteen is building with timber and now now many people are asking the same question how can i build this with timber now this already started from the architectural office architectures famous architectures of turkey are asking same questions to us so the students who are attending this uh, lecture I mean, this is our lecture's name, but the students were attending the Archidesign Timber Talks, the meetings, the uh, some lectures like today, uh, they are very lucky because its starting point is uh, thinking with uh, designing and thinking about timber, I guess. Absolutely. But, but we are lucky. Now we are lucky then last 20 years. Now we are, uh, they are asking the right questions now. That's excellent. And Turkey actually is one of the most interesting countries from this perspective, because I go to Bodrum and the person is building a wooden bullet. Now, that's a very difficult project, a wood project. And there are labor that, you know, people uh, can do that. And you know, one has to look look at that aspect. And also one has to look these country uh, cities like Safranbolu yeah. and uh, maybe uh, other places where uh, there are people who are able to maintain all mm -hmm. traditional wood buildings. They mm -hmm. can be your champions first, maybe. You know, they because those people are already familiar with wood. And uh, so, what I think is, uh, I was talking to uh, Ms. Demet uh, the other day, and in the case of education, I think it's a good idea to have a network of mm. universities, uh, trade schools. This way, at least, uh, if there is a school there who can, who are hands-on, like you are, you need hands-on education for yes, we, we uh, for have. what. Uh, what uh, you are saying and I agree 100 percent and there are schools like that in 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 for instance Canada I wonder in Turkey in Turkey if you have uh, schools like that that you can work together but what you said is the one of the most important items and by the way right now there is a construction boom in Canada and uh, Canada is having problems too to have enough people to to build. And uh, I guess uh, prefabrication, of course, is making these things a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's a, it's a philosophical thing. In, I think in Canada, some of the politicians, they like to stick build because there are, it, it hires more people. Prefabrication kind of cuts jobs sometimes. And, mm -hmm. uh, but in Europe, they are really into prefabrication a lot. 
And so that's another thing to, to because in, when, the, when everything is prefabricated, then you don't need that art stuff. You need mm -hmm. people to put things together like a Lego. But uh, when you are, you need a, you either need a carpenter or you don't. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for instance, in Canada, we have framers for the stick building and they have, they have nail guns and that's the way they built. In Europe, it's all done in the, in the, in the factory. So I'm presenting both of you to both of them to you, so that uh, you know there are two ways, different ways of doing it. But the topic is who is going to put it together. That's what you are raising, and that's a very important. I don't have an answer, but the thing is, uh, the reason that I am presenting a little bit like this because it's going to be a collective yes. solution from everybody, because as you can see. I have some answers in earthquake, but my fire knowledge is what I heard in the last 40 years from my fire colleagues. But the thing is, you need to, you know, them to raise up, and uh, but that's part of the infrastructure. You need the materials, you need people to design, you need people to build, and you people, even the insurance industry. You are going to have a little yeah. bit of an uphill battle because. If I am an insurance insurer, I'm going to say, what is this? You are yeah. putting an 18-story wood building in Istanbul? No, <laughs> that's the first answer will be. But the thing is, that's the way it was here. But uh, here, for instance, also associations like Turkish Timber Association is very mm -hmm. important here because you know you have to ensure ensure people that what they are getting is not another failure. Mm -hmm. And I hope my presentation doesn't get uh, misunderstood because you can design a very beautiful concrete building uh, and safe. And some of them did very well anyway. But the thing is, at the end of the day, though, uh, the result of in these two earthquakes show that, you know, uh, we have to do something about this. Yes. OK, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. And uh, I agree with you, Erobojam. It is time to have a good construction strategy for Turkey. It's time. It's time. Yes. I guess we have a meeting in Friday in Ankara. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think I already seen Aryo is uh, listening us to, to this evening. Uh, also, we have a project in the government side. I think it's time to have a good construction strategy as soon as possible for Turkey. And and you can maybe choose some pilot yeah. zone. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go to, for instance, I don't know, I haven't been in Beypazar for a while, but obviously some people were able to upgrade some of the buildings and I looked mm -hmm. at them, they were pretty good. Maybe some pilot projects can be chosen mm -hmm. and uh, in, in, in regions where there is some labor as well mm -hmm. and maybe and hopefully i mean we are going to have more architects and engineers <laughs> because that's very important too and your your university is playing a big role there and uh, because if the interest is there mm -hmm. and and also you i understand you are also serving to the surrounding areas because turkey is a leader country in middle east and if, if it starts in Turkey, it may actually go to other ones too. Yes. Okay. I, I'm just looking for the questions, but there's no question on the chat box. One more question. Yes. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, thank you for your instructive presentation, firstly. Uh, I'm going to have a specific question. Uh, in developing countries, we know that you are making life cycle assessments in order to make decision about construction. I wonder how long uh, is uh, you are taking, let's say that for light foot frame in into calculation uh, as a lifespan to do to do life cycle assessment. Oh. 
that's a that's a very good question. Uh, in terms of now, I, I, let me answer this way first. Uh, the loads that we use in the code are 50-year return loads, like 50 years. So if your building is going to be used a lot longer, it means the probability may increase uh, that your building is going to see those loads. But this is the structural side, not life cycle size side. Uh, and the second thing that uh, I can tell is one of my colleagues did a study on uh, life cycle of buildings, like, you know, when buildings are being demolished. And the numbers were quite low in uh, commercial type buildings, like factories and those kind of things. But the thing is, uh, for instance, the house that I have, I am in, I talking to you right now, is 96 years old wooden building house <laughs> so uh, some of them are still in use some of them are not but what number that uh, our life life cycle uh, experts are using that i don't know i can uh, find out and uh, um, and uh, but uh, uh, that's all i can say uh, you know from uh, usually Usually, uh, we still have lots of houses in Vancouver, for instance. They are more than 100 years old. And uh, But what do the, the question that you are asking is, I don't have an answer, is what number they use in their life cycle analysis for the building life. Maybe I should find that out and I can come back to you on that. Okay, uh, thank you. Maybe I can have another question mm -hmm. uh, from from structure perspective, mm -hmm. behalf of our students, some technical questions. You showed us some uh, CLT uh, slab systems without, <laughs> without any beam. Uh, how many meters we can pass from this slab between columns at maximum? Now, this is a very good question again. And uh, now the building, the one thing is uh, CLT, you can make up to 60 centimeters. So if you make a 60 centimeter slab, it's going to be very expensive, but you can, you can pass a big span with it. But the thing is, uh, when they are, and this is the reason CLT handbook is very helpful. Because if you look at that CLT handbook, you are going to see how the designer approached that problem. And uh, this, this is one thing. So, I mean, economically, how, what is the best? And uh, the second one is using the slab two ways, structurally, or one way, like a strip. And uh, some designers, for instance, in that uh, building that uh, from Vancouver Island, they used two way. Uh, two because when when it is you are able to use the slab two ways instead of one way, uh, you can reduce the, the the depth of the slab. So that's from a structural perspective how you use it. And uh, now in the Brock Commons building, I think. The slab, the the point, and it's and we did this test by the way at FB Innovations because the designer wanted to know, hey, can I use the column just like this, in the without beams, and then we did that the the, the, the test. And I think the spans were there about three meters because it was student, uh, student uh, uh, residence, and uh, that way comfortably they were able to skip the beams and but that's only one number and uh, and i'm not sure if they use two-way calculation or one-way calculation in that building but i know that in the vancouver island building they use the two-way in the vancouver island building i think it's a good idea to take a look at that uh, uh, that building and there are, by the way, all these buildings have very nice case studies on them. There, there are reports by different organizations. 
and you can take a look at and this topic uh, uh, it may, maybe it is uh, it is already covered there so giving only I only gave you one number but the thing is you can probably achieve more numbers by looking at these case studies and the CLT handbook but uh, yeah and then if you have uh, bigger spans then some designers are using hidden steel beams and what they are doing is so you you still don't see the beam because the beam is at the same height depth as the CLT slab but the CLT slab comes and sits in in in, in that beam in steel beam and that way uh, they are able to do it in bigger spans and there are some also pre post tensioning applications on CLT as well but uh, I haven't put them in yet because uh, I don't know where they are on that in terms of application because another way to of course get bigger span is post tensioning the the CLT or the wood vapors Thank you very much. Well, thank you. These are very thank important you. questions, though, because yes. uh, this is where uh, this is where you will get the challenging things. Because it's easy to do the three meter, but when you have five meters, then what do you do? And uh, uh, the calculation says, well, use a 14 layer CLT, but that's going to be too expensive. And uh, so this is one of the, I, I think the, this is the, one of the reasons that really looking at all these case studies mm -hmm. and see what others did. Mm -hmm. and, and also please look at the serviceability issues because mm -hmm. we can have a very good structural solution, but the thing is it may, it may vibrate too much. Like some, some airports, I don't know if, if you noticed that in some airports, yeah, yeah. You know, they, they, it, 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 you know, the floor vibrations is is annoying, and you don't want to have that. And uh, so, uh, I think uh, uh, we, one of my colleagues, Lin Hu, just uh, releasing a, a, a handbook on this soon coming out. Again, you can when it comes out, you can download it. The, the vibration, floor vibrations, because sometimes they govern, not the structural, not the strength, but the floor vibrations can govern. Okay, thank you very much for the answer, because uh, this afternoon we have a, a jury uh, in our lecture and we already uh, has some same questions with uh, Ito Jam. Uh, thank you very much. We have we discussed uh, the dimensions of uh, CLT and the span of uh, Gululam, something like this. Thank you very much for the question and the answer. Thank you very much. And uh, I think yeah, uh, yeah, we have no question. Uh, and. Uh, this meeting is finishing now. Thank you very much again. Uh, and uh, Mr. Karajabeydi, Erol uh, we have a little tradition in our uh, meetings. We donate to our guest name and the donation has been in your name to say foundation have been underprivileged uh, children for quality in education. I will uh, send your certification to you as an email. Uh, and uh, once again, thank you very much for your informative uh, in presentation this evening. Thank you very much for having me, first of all, for inviting me. It was a pleasure for me. And thank you very much for making that donation on behalf of me. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, um, thank you, um, Errol Bey uh, and uh, Demet Ojan. I'm stopping the recording and thank you very much for this uh, very informative uh, presentation and thank you for the book recommendations. Yes. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm stopping the recording. And thank you for the um, participants. Yes, thank you for participants. <laughs>